following prescribed is transcribed. The time has come for scary things. I see you finally graduated to a live audience now instead of using that phony laugh track. They're on tape. That yours truly Spengoli brings. If horrible creatures our movies bring forth, and tonight's coffin opener, then is the menace all grown up. Jay North! Hey, hey! Wait a minute, Jay. No, no, you don't hit me yet. Where it says on the cue card, hit me with chicken. What am I supposed to read? You're here actually to introduce tonight's feature. Okay, Would you? I'm supposed it to read It says J-A-Y. J-A-Y. And now, Spenguli presents Fred Astaire, don't Max... Don't it's not polite. Go Fred ahead. Astaire, Max Baer, Barbara McNair, and Sonny and Cher with Valentin Janiki as freeze-dried sweat socks and you show me a pair of antique wooden false teeth and I'll show you the George Washington Bridge. I wrote that for you. Oh, you... Oh, you... Oh, you... Oh, you... <laughs> Pumpy is not going to hurt you one bit. 
just relax and sleep. Sleep, sleep, sleep. And in the morning, you'll find yourselves in your new home. Hey, my pitch. <laughs> Good morning, Doc. What you got there? Aaron, I found some new friends. Listen. Wasp, you better be careful. They can sting a man to death. Don't worry. We understand each other. They know who their friend is. They can tell. Yeah, but they know when you ain't, too. Uh, if you knew about wasps what I know, you'd have no fear of them, my boy. No fear. Things running at the front office. Smooth as honey, Renfro. <laughs> I see here you turned in over a thousand pounds of orange blossom honey and 400 of beeswax last month, Renfro. Congratulations. You've made the top of the list again. Thank you, sir. Are they honey needs your kind of man, Renfro? You stay with it, and I can see a bright future for you with the company. Well, I do try to do my best, Mr. Barker. I try to take my inspiration from the bees. Always busy, busy, busy. Yes. Uh, what about this fellow, Dr. Zinthrop? Zinthrop? <laughs> Boy, there's a nut. Him and his bees. You know, it wouldn't surprise me someday to see him flapping his arms, taking off after some queen bee with the rest of the drones. Mm -hmm. Well, he's paid to do research on royal jelly. Haven't had a progress report from him in a month. Hmm. Well, he has a little workshop up there back of the orange grove. Keeps a few colonies. I suppose I'd better go up there and take a look. Hey, you! Where's this fellow Zinthrop? No, oh, he's up where the extractor is, up there. Huh. Hey, hey. This isn't a honeybee. These are wasps. Wasps? Who's responsible for this? Most likely Dr. Zinthrop, sir. I told you he was a crackpot. Zinthrop, huh? Vincent. 
Ventra. Ventra. Now look here, Ventra. What's all this nonsense about what? I'm so glad you dropped in, Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker, I'm on the verge of a great discovery. Discovery? What do you mean? Well, sir, I almost perfected a new method of extracting royal jelly from the Queen Wasp. According to my figures, you're better at extracting funds from the company. Now look here, Zinthrop, over $1,000 last month for miscellaneous. Yes, yes, I know. But, Mr. Barker, let me just show you something. Just let me show you something. Already I've learned to slow the process of aging. Soon, I shall be able to reverse it entirely. What are you getting at, Zinthrop? Look, what do you see? I see a big dog and a little dog. Let's say an old dog and a young dog. All right, so what? Well, they're exactly the same age. You see, the little one, Greta, has been given regular injections of my compound from the Queen Wasp. Just like I told you, Mr. Barker. Now look here, Zintrup. I understand about science and progress and all that, but you were retained to extract Queen Bee Royal Jelly. Now, it's a health food, a, a cosmetic. It, it's not a, a miracle drug or an elixir of youth. That sort of thing is impossible. Oh, but Mr. Fark is... Zintrup, I, I'm sorry, Zintrup, but I'm going to have to let you go. You just don't seem to be one of the team. You, you understand. Good luck. I'm sure you'll fit in somewhere. Fit in somewhere. shall find a home somehow, somewhere. Oh, but you sound impatient. I know, it's your beans, huh? They're hungry and uh, they must be fed. Uh, now, now, how would you like a nice, juicy little caterpillar, huh? Yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you? There. Now, you must eat them. Be strong because, well, a lot of work to do together. Yes, sir. A lot of work. As you can see, gentlemen, sales for the last fiscal quarter have dropped. Fourteen and one half percent. There's not been a corresponding drop in our competitive sales. I trust one of you gentlemen has a satisfactory explanation for this decline. Not one little suggestion, gentlemen. We'll start with you, Thompson. As public relations manager, no doubt you have some faint glimmering of what's happening to Stalin products. Well, Thompson. Well, you see, I, uh... I had no idea you were such an excellent public speaker, Thompson. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Darlin. I guess I'm not feeling very well this morning. I'm sorry you aren't. I think I can tell you why Stalin products are falling off so badly, Miss Starlin. We're listening, Lane. Where would you put the responsibility for this decline? On you, Miss Stalin. I imagine you have arguments to support that contention. We've all been looking at it for the past 20 minutes. The most convincing argument is right on that graph. May I show you? Thank you. Now, right here in April is when Starlin sales started falling off. Very clever of you, Lane. Would you mind waiting until I finish, Miss Starlin? That's enough, Lane. Relax, Willis. My apologies for the interruption. Thank you. Now, as I said, sales began to fall in April. 
But the reason for the fall was back here in February. Now, the Stalin products have always been thought of as something of a, a modern miracle in the cosmetics trade. A firm built to a multi-million dollar a year business on the strength and appeal of, of one person, Janice Stalin. From the beginning right through until February of this year, only one woman's face was used to advertise those products. Your face, Miss Stalin. The public have come to accept you as a, as a symbol. Well, now, after 16 years, they see a different face. They, they don't trust it. They feel cheated. The simple fact is that Stalin Cosmetics should have Janice Stalin's picture advertising them. Well, that's about all I've got to say. And a darn good job of saying it, too. I agree. Uh, Lane makes a lot of sense on that score, Miss Stalin. I think I've had enough flattery for one morning, gentlemen. It was a very convincing argument, Lane. There's a Mr. Sintrick to see Miss Stalin. There's only one small factor you've overlooked. Not even Janice Stalin can remain a glamour girl forever. Miss Stalin. Yes, Mary. There's a Mr. Zintrup in reception. He says he has an appointment. Thank you. Well, this has been a very informative get-together. That'll be all for now. Hi, I'm Jay Norton, and you're watching the one and only Sven Gulli. In case you didn't recognize me right off, I'm the guy who used to play Dennis the Menace when I was a little kid, of course. I feel quite far removed from those childish days since I am now a serious, mature, adult actor. And so, after more of tonight's exciting motion picture, Sven Gulli returns. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Wilson, wait for me! Something on your mind, Miss Stalin? You've done some work on royal jelly, haven't you? Oh, a little. Are there any real therapeutic values in it? Well, I'd say so. Of course, uh, a lot depends on each individual's reaction to the stuff. What do you mean? Just that no two people react in precisely the same way. One man's meat's another man's poison. Oh. But you think royal jelly can be beneficial in some cases. Queen Bee said a lot of stuff about it. I'll accept that as an affirmative answer. Supposing a more powerful form of royal jelly could be obtained. From the Queen Wasp, for example. I mean, well, do you suppose that might have some rejuvenating effect on a human being? I'd stay away from wasps if I were you, Miss Dolan. Socially, the queen wasp is on level with a black widow spider. They're both carnivorous. They paralyze their victims and then take their time devouring them alive. They kill their mates in the same way, too. Strictly a one-sided romance. Well, I'm, I'm not exactly interested in, in the love life of the queen wasp. I want your opinion the possibilities of using enzyme extracts from royal wasp jelly, commercially. Well, if you want an honest opinion, Miss Stalin. Of course I want an honest opinion. And my advice is forget about it. Thank you, Arthur. Any time, Miss Stalin. Mr. Zinthrop, come in. Yes, Miss Darling. Uh, you can go in out there. Oh. Oh, come. Janice Darling Enterprises. Miss Darling? Yes. How do you do? I'm afraid I won't be able to give you much time, Mr. Zinthrop. But it is I who give you the time, Miss Darling. Oh, yes. Plenty of time I give you. Ten, maybe fifteen years I give you. 
I want you to understand one thing very clearly, Mr. Zentrum. I expect absolute proof of what you claim in your letter. Tangible proof, not words. <laughs> Such proof you shall get, madame, and more. But I think I'd better show you in the laboratory, yes? Out of their misery. Madame, you ask for proof? Please be kind enough to look at proof you ask for. May I proceed? Thank you. minutes, madame, you shall see a miracle you shall not believe. Oh, no tricks. <laughs> you may look if you like. I have no tricks. Well, don't look at me. <laughs> I'm not changing. See, you do not believe one animal, so I bring two. I, uh, I show you again? Yes? Yes, I must be sure. Yes, madam. everything I need for my research. If we're successful, well, I ask for a little percentage. But I must get full credit for my discovery. That is most important to me. I'll have Gordon draw out the contracts. Oh, contracts, contracts, I do not need to give me your word. Good enough for me. You amaze me. Frankly, when I received your letter, I thought you were just a, another eccentric. There's always a chance you might not be. Then you walk in here and show me nothing short of a miracle. Two miracles. And you say that you'll accept my word that I won't cheat you. You won't. I know you're a good woman, even if you do not like other people to know it. However, uh, my formula may not be good for human beings. I have not tested yet. You will on me. Oh, no, 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 no. There might be danger. Those are my terms, Mr. Sintra. Jana Stalin will be your next guinea pig. Very well. Though it may take a little time to prepare sufficient extract, a week, maybe more. I'll make whatever arrangements you may need for your equipment. Thank you, madame. Now I see how you built all this. <laughs> I'm very close to losing it, Mr. Sintra. Maybe... Working together, we can save Janice Starlin Enterprises. Maybe even make it bigger than ever before. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm sure the next three months we'll see a rise in Starlin sales that will surpass anything we've dared imagine. Mr. Zinthrop is working on the final stages of a development that will revolutionize the cosmetic industry. He's to have a free hand in his experiments it will be answerable to no one but myself. At the moment, I cannot divulge the nature of Mr. Zinthrop's experiments, but I can assure you it will bring worldwide recognition to Janice Starlin Enterprises. <laughs>
Elizabeth must be the granddaddy of all confidence men to take in a guy like Starlin. Why doesn't somebody wise her up? Like you, for instance? Bill, what makes you think Zinthrop really isn't on the level? After all, we don't even know what he's working on. It could be very legitimate. Oh, you're as bad as she is. Oh, women. <laughs> men. Every time you're stuck for an answer, you always come up with women. You're not getting out of this one so easily. I'd like to know why you think Zintrup really hasn't got something. Well, you can call it male intuition if you like. It's just that there's something about this whole business that doesn't smell right. The private laboratory, the secret experiments, Zintrup himself. The only thing that's missing is a genie with a lamp. You better leave the intuition to me. I'll let you buy me dinner. Buy you dinner? What's happened to your sporting blood? I thought we were going to toss for the check. Oh, no. You won the last three times. All right, look, I'll make a deal with you. Dinner is on me if you promise to keep an eye on what goes on in there. Well, what do you want me to do? Read her mail and send you messages and keep your code? You could do worse. Oh, no, Mr. Cooper, not you, too. I've been trying to tell Bright Eyes here that I think Zinthrop is a phony and a confidence man. If I were sure of that, I wouldn't be worried. I think he's a lot more dangerous. A quack. Oh, well, I don't follow you, Coop. Well, a confidence man is just be interested in your money. The only damage they can do is to your pocketbook. A quack can be fatal. <laughs> I says, listen, Oiving, I'm getting sick of this TV every night. I mean, you know, we can do the same thing in a nightclub. Well, almost. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Janice Darlin Enterprises. I got two words for you. Drop dead. Twice. Irving, calls me to tell me Dr. Cyclops is on Channel 9 tonight. I've seen it twice already. Good morning. Is, uh, is Miss Darling in her office now? Hmm? Oh, Miss Darling's in conference. Would you like to speak to her secretary? Oh, no, no, no. Just say to Miss Darling, I should like to see her when she has time. Huh? Yes. Was there something else, Mr. Vincent? Even the bow. Good morning. May I see Miss Zardling, please? <laughs> He's a real weirdy. Wonder what his game is. Who cares? You know, Morton thinks he's a crackpot. I heard him telling Cooper so. Old Bug Eyes really has the execs worried. But so what? That's just it. They don't know. Oh. So anyway, back to Irving. showed you last week? No. What about it? Well, I want you to look at him. Come. No. Quite a difference, yes? I think perhaps you'll be able to find out for yourself, Miss Darling. Today, today will be your first injection.
on line three. What is it, Gleason? I sent you a memo. Mr. Zinthrop has carte blanche to order anything he requires. It is no concern of yours, Gleason. Make out a check for the full amount. Sue? Mary. Can I talk to Mr. Lane a minute? Bill? Hey, listen. Gleason just got a bill for $2,300. Zinthrop. Enzyme extracts. making progress. There's great improvement in the tissue. Why is it taking so long? It's the third week. You forget, my dear, there's more to you than a little kitten, no? Besides, there's a difference in metabolism. Why not increase the dosage? Wouldn't that step up the process? Patience, my dear, patience. We must tread lightly with care, Your Honor. solution of the enzymes. Oh, a great deal more powerful than the solution I've been using in your injection. Oh? Yes. And I think, I think it will be better for lotions. As an emollient lotion, it'll make estrogenic creams and all such products old-fashioned. My dear, Stalin will be world famous, bringing you to millions. You're right, Zentra. There are going to be a few red faces in my advertising department. But I am right. Why, your own mirror will tell you that I am right. Why, you look at least five years younger than you looked three weeks ago. <laughs> I know. Talk to Bill a minute, Sue. Thanks. Bill, I think I've got it. Yeah, I'm a nervous wreck. Good luck. We'll have more of tonight's cinematic catastrophe, Speed Racer meets Andy Granatelli, right after this commercial message. Friends, when a 250-pound bully threatens you, what do you do? Do you apologize for hitting his fist with your face, huh? Do you stand up to him and end up getting scraped off the sidewalk? Or do you unleash a wild, dynamic flurry of action by running away? <laughs> That's what I do tell you the truth. Well, now, now, fear no man and some broads ever again, because I'll give you the know -how. I'll give you the skills. I'll give you the movements. You'll give me a headache. Cool it. Yes. Now, cowards, learn to fend for yourself. That's Sven Gulli's School of Self-Defense, Karate, Judo, Kung Fu, and Crochet. Crocheting? Sure. That way your bones knit faster. Crochet, knit. <laughs> yes. We've taken the fierce tactics of such fear fighters as lady cab drivers, Haitian hot food givers, Israeli chicken flickers, and oriental masters of kung fu. Of what? <laughs> what was the question? Of what? Kung fu! Kung fu! Gesundheit. Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're probably wondering what's included in the course, you're wondering. Uh, uh, what's included in well, the... Uh, well, uh, well, it. this course includes this famous move. Now, watch closely. This move is a karate chop strong enough to stop a wild pig. <laughs> A wild pig. Ibni, ibni, ibni. What do you call that? It was a pork chop. Or, call it, or for the more mild mannered types, a lamb chop. <laughs> Get it? Okay, now, to show you how easy self defense can be, I'll show you how to stop any attacker by simply moving one finger. Huh? Now watch closely, here's how. Suppose a big ugly brute leaps at you and admits a desire to jump on your top. With this next amazing move, you can stop him dead in his tracks. All you do is reach behind you, see? Oh, one finger is all you need. You raise your hand and you say, stick him up. <laughs> That's it, move one finger. Isn't that amazing? And if you enroll now, I'll send you these three self-defense booklets. First of all, the actual history of the phrase, your shoelace is untied, huh? Also, foot fighting, or how to defeat your arch enemy. And finally, the Dean Martin defense method. This one shows you how to hit a guy with a wire. So, become a brilliant brute today. Just send your life savings and next of kin to this address. There it is, Svengoli's School of Self-Defense Care of Sakatomi. Because there are too many chickens in the world. Yes, another off-color offshoot of STD Enterprises. STD. Sham. Trickery and... <laughs> defensive dodging. Uh, Mr. Zinthrop's a very capable confidence man, from what I read in this letter. He claims he can stimulate the processes of rejuvenation through the use of enzymes extracted from wasps. Oh, for... Well, what are you two Sherlock's going to do about it? Right now, I don't know. Frankly, I'm getting tired of the whole business. That woman's so intent on holding back time, she's ready to fall for the first phony line she hears. Wasps. Phil! Face the facts, Mary Janice Starland has built her whole life on youth and beauty. Now that she's losing them, she's scared to death. Well, right now, she's on cloud nine with that quack Zinthrop that I'd hate to be around when she comes back down to Earth. Well, maybe we can let her down easy. I think we owe her that much. Yeah. Well, what are we gonna do? We can't just let Zinthrop build up her hopes and then knock the props out from under her. How can he do such a terrible thing? Poor Jan. There must be something we can do before it's too late. He's got a mighty convincing argument. Very impressive to the layman. Ten to one, he's got a record just as impressive. Well, there are ways to find out. The answer might be right here in our hands. Ted. I'm gonna keep this letter for a day or two. Wait a minute. Suppose she finds out it's gone. I'm the only one with access to that desk. She'll know I took it. Well, it's a chance you have to take, Mary. I think we can be pretty sure that Coop knows what he's doing, honey. Huh? Well, come on, young lovers.
What is it, Maureen? It is you, Miss Dunn. Of course it's me. Who did you think it was? You look so different. Finish your nail. Maureen. Hmm? I think your phone is ringing. Oh. Yes, Miss Darlin. Good morning. Janice Darlin Enterprises. Gentlemen. Janice Darlin Enterprises is about to start on the most widespread publicity campaign in the history of the cosmetic industry. Our slogan will be, Return to Youth for Janice Darlin. When Mrs. Simpson arrives, there will be a press interview and all questions regarding the rejuvenation process will be referred to him. That'll be all for now, gentlemen. It's amazing. Oh, it's wonderful. You look marvelous. I said that will be all for now, gentlemen. Good morning. Oh, not you, Mary. Wait a moment, please. Yes, Miss Darling. Mary, isn't it wonderful? It's a miracle. A wonderful, incredible miracle. We were so worried about you. We really thought you were in danger. <laughs> we even went to plotting how to, how to rescue you from Mr. Zinthrop. <laughs> it all seems so silly. It seems ridiculous. Oh, Mary. Mary, how old do I look? Tell me. How old? How old do I look? Tell me. How old? 23? Maybe 22? That's how old I was when I started Janice Darlin Enterprises. Do you realize what that means? I'm back where I started, 18 years ago, with what it took 18 years to accomplish. It's like a dream.
find him, Mr. Hellman. I don't care what it costs. Well, we'll find him, all right. Sooner or later, we find them all. Time is vital, Mr. Hellman. Every hour he's gone, it means more than you can possibly imagine. Well, you haven't given me very much to go on. No home address, no former employer, no phone. This is just like starting from scratch. Mr. Zinthrop wasn't a, a conventional employee. He didn't go through regular personnel. Uh-huh. You say he came here about a month ago. Well, how did he come here, Miss Starlin? He just didn't walk in off the street, did he? The letters. Right here in my drawer. Maybe, uh, one of the other drawers. So that's what she meant. What who meant? Miss Starlin. The letter's been taken, and you think you know who took it, is that right? My secretary, Miss Tennyson. You got her address handy? Her phone number. It might be better if I busted in on her cold. This way, she'll have a chance to prepare a story. I know what I'm doing. All right. Mary? Janice, darling. Before I went to lunch, I made a duplicate copy of Mr. Zendrup's letter. I was going to take that one to Bill and Mr. Cooper at first. But then I thought that the original would be better. Have you got the copy? Yes, it's in my desk. Get that copy, Miss Dennison. Uh-huh. 946 West 73rd Street, Manhattan. Yeah, that's right. Get right on it, Jerry, and check back with me as soon as you can. Sure, he's our boy. Uh huh. Is he? Central emergency. Mm hmm. Right. Well, it looks like we've got him. This is John Doe down at Central Emergency, auto accident. There's no identification on him, but he was wearing a lab smock and Phil Zinthrope's description. Mary, get my coat and Lane, get a cab downstairs. He badly hurt. Head injury, general contusions of the body. He's had a severe injury, and there's definite brain damage. Just how much, we can't tell as yet. How long before you'll know? It's hard to say, Miss Starling. Who's the best man for this kind of injury? Well, there's several top specialists. Get the best. I'll take full responsibility for the expenses. Yes, Miss Starling. And now, on Play 
a new feature that, judging from the rehearsal, might be making its farewell appearance. It's Van Gooley's... Believe it or forget it. Yes! Yes, freaking his fans, time to journey with Svengoli to the land of the weird, the bizarre, the grotesque. Away. Amen there. Uh, anyway, it's Svengoli's Believe It or Forget It. Believe It or Forget It. Fact number one. The Taj Mahal was turned upside down in an earthquake. Ooh. And it looks better that way, huh? <laughs> Believe it yes. or forget it. Do not. Fact number two, Emperor Constantine the 23rd, ruler of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, was so badly in need of money during his reign that he moonlighted as a washroom attendant. How do you like that? Huh? Believe it or forget it. Okay, how are we doing? You want to hear more, huh? Uh, okay, next fact. The, the Godney bird which is found only high in the Himalaya Mountains, but everyone's high in the Himalaya Mountains. <laughs> that bird can imitate the cry of any animal in the world. Ooh. However, it does a lousy Jimmy Cagney, it says here. You better believe it, you dirty rat. Not bad. Can you do Kerry Grant? Never mind. Okay. Moving right along. The natives of Tanganyika, high in the Himalaya Mountains, believe that a bird in the hand a bird in the hand, no, no, a bird in the hand, there he is, is worth two in the bush. And in Tanganyika, it is. Believe it, Believe it. Or, or go wash your socks. Hey, just a few more fans, here we go. Sylvia Spango of Ishpeming, Michigan, who, as you can see, died recently at the age of 97. Aww. Didn't even know she was sick, did you? Spent most of her natural life, it says here, in a hole in the ground. Sylvia was a gopher. <laughs> That's why she was... Believe it or forget it. Okay. Mrs. Clara Footfungus of Tombstone, Arizona, owns an eggplant that shaped like a banana. <laughs> ah, yes. Mrs. Footfungus herself is shaped like a pear. Lovely lady. There she is. Okay. Just Believe one more. Believe it or get back to the movie. Already. One more and then we're at it. Okay, Svengoli, it says here, a well-known TV horror movie host, when he refused to stop one of his dumb bits, was actually pelted by a barrage of rubber chickens, pigs, and fish. I don't believe it. Believe it or let him have it, boys. Wait, 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 stop, hold it. I don't know, Arthur. I think it best we wait. But it's been three days since the accident, Jan. And no sign of improvement. He's still in a coma. You heard what the doctor said. He may never regain consciousness. And even if he does, who knows how badly his brain has been damaged. Well, I'll give it another 48 hours. If he doesn't regain consciousness by then, well, you can take over the laboratory, Arthur. Janet. It's my decision.
Jones goes on a fritz right in the middle of a good program. advertising campaign in the history of cosmetic advertising. Every newspaper and magazine in the country will be flooded with our new slogan, Return to Youth with Janice Darwin. Excuse me, uh, Miss Darwin. What is it, Thompson? Well, I think we should be a little conservative, Miss Darwin. Uh, cosmetics are one thing, medications another. We're liable to run into trouble. Yes. All advertising copy will be cleared through your office. Well, it's a touchy business, you know. Max is right, Miss Starla. You don't have to second the motion, May. I want one thing understood very clearly now, gentlemen. Janice Starlin Enterprises is going to bring the most fantastically saleable product ever developed by Martin Cosmetics to the public. And I don't intend to be restricted by timidity on the part of my own staff, is that clear? Are you all right, Miss Tarla? Just a, just a little headache, Mary. I'm fine. Can I get you something? I'm all right. I'm all right. Thank you. I have some aspirin in my purse. Sorry, Mary. Well, that'll be all for now, Jeff. the girls working at Starlin first crack at that new stuff. Imagine being 18 again. I guess if it can take 15 years off Starlin, it can take 10 off you. What do you mean, 10? Face it, honey. This is Maureen you're talking to. Yeah? Well, if I were you, I'd take a double dose. Then maybe Irving wouldn't watch television so much. So who says he looks at it? I can't imagine what else he does. Three guesses. Say, did Cooper come in yet? Mm-mm. Missed a board meeting this morning. I bet Starlin's having a fit. He should worry. Uh-oh. See you later. Bye, honey. Hi, pretty puss. You know where, um, Miss Starlin's office is? Sweet number one. <laughs> La dee da, the Duchess of Flatbush herself. How'd you like to have this phone wrapped around your ear, wise guy? It's more like it, sister. Sweet number one. Thanks. Miss Darling. Oh, what is it, Mary? Is there anything I can do? Yes. Is, uh, is Mr. Zinthrop's room ready? Oh, uh-huh. The nurse is fixing the emergency equipment now, and the ambulance is due any minute. Well, be sure to let me know when it arrives. Oh, Mary, please, before you go, could you see if you could work that thing? Oh, sure. I've seen lots of these. had a room specially made over for you, Mr. Nintrup. And Miss Warren has a room adjoining yours, so there'll be someone near you at all times. Thank you. Thank you. When you're feeling better, Mr. Nintrup, there are a few things I'd like to discuss with you. Good, good. Uh. We'll do everything we can to make you comfortable, Mr. Zinthrop. 
I'm going to spend the nights here in my office. So if anything develops, I'll be on hand. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Only, only there's something. I must tell you something important. But, important, but... Uh, I cannot remember. Uh, I'm sure it can wait. Right now, the main thing is to get you back to health. Uh, Take good uh, care of him, Miss Warren. Yes, Miss Darling. Sure is funny about old Coop. He misses one day of work, and you're ready to call Mrs. Percy. Well, he's a pretty conscientious guy, honey. If he felt sick or something, he'd have called in. Relax. We'll probably be in Brighton Chipper in the morning. Interrupting something? Oh, we were just having a little coffee clutch, Miss Starlin. We were talking about Mr. Cooper. What about Mr. Cooper? Well, about his missing the meeting this morning. Nobody's been able to reach him all day. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. Mr. Cooper's been here a long time. Probably feel he's entitled to take a day for himself now and then. That's what I've been trying to tell Mr. Lane. Oh, by the way, Miss Starlin, how is Mr. Zinthrop? Oh, fine. In a few days, we'll uh, start the layouts for the campaign. Oh, I'm ready when you are, boss. Look this over. Hey, Bill. Huh? Don't go getting any ideas about the boss. For well, me? Don't be silly. I just wanted to know that I'm an eager member of the team. Still, she is looking a lot younger these days, isn't she? You think Zinthrop would give you any of those treatments? You know, break the lights or something? Mr. Green, that personnel is his responsibility. I have other things to think about than worrying whether the night watchman walked off the job. Well, that's just it, Miss Darling. Mr. Green feels that the watchman never left the building. His lunch pail and his raincoat are still in the basement. I don't want to hear anything more about it, Mary. All right, Miss Darling. Will you see? Where she heard a scream from one of the other floors. Zinthrop heard it too, but she convinced him he was having a bad dream. Oh, maybe they both were. That's not funny anymore, Mary. There's something going on in that building. And I'm going to find out what it is. How? Have a look around Cooper's lab, for one thing. After that, I, I don't know. Hold it steady. Bill, this is crazy. We can really get in trouble. I won't tire him, Miss Warren, but it is important. All right, Miss Darling, I'll be in my room. Sinthrop. Sinthrop, you've got to help me. Something's happening. Something's happening to me. I can't control it. There is something I must remember, but I, I can't. Try to think. The wasp enzymes. The, the extracts you, you were experimenting with before the accident. Try to think. <laughs> well, this is Zinthrop's notebook, Mary. Notes on his experiments with Jan. Well, how did Cooper get hold of it? Only Coop would show up. Mary, look. It's Mr. 
Cooper's pipe. Well, don't you get it? He's going to go out without his pants and leave that pipe behind. He's still somewhere in the building. I bet a year's salary on it. If he is, he... He's dead. And the night watchman. There's only enough left for one more injection. One more. You've got to make more, Zinza. Help me, Zinza. Please, please, my head. Oh, my head. Behind all this, it's him. Mr. Zintra. Bill. Look at to be alarmed about, Mr. Zinthrop. I'm Bill Lane, and this is Miss Dennison, Miss Starlin's secretary. Miss Starlin? The cat? What about a cat? Must warn her. Injections. Must not take any more injections. Is Miss Starlin in danger? Terrible danger. I'm, I was... Now take it easy, Mr. Uh, Zinthrop. You're still pretty weak. Mary, see if you can get Jan on the phone. All right. No answer. Oh, Miss Starlin? Is that you, Mary? Where are you? We're in the building. We're in Mr. Zintrup's room. Something's happened down here. Here, let in... me talk to her. Hello, Miss Starlin. This is Lane. Why are you and Mary still in the building? Oh, I'm myself. I'm Don't responsible. Don't let it go, Mary. Uh, yeah. oh, I'm myself. Uh, uh, I must not I hold can't me explain now, Miss Starlin. I must, I must go. Hang on to it. I must help. Uh, you must not hold me back. I'm... Don't Mr. Zentrup, we won't let anything happen to Miss Starlin. Hello. Hello, Miss Starlin. What's going on down there? Stay in your office. I'll be right up. Keep an eye on Zentrup, honey. I'm going upstairs. Oh, no. No, no. The insects. The insects. Take it easy, Mr. Zentrup. You do not understand. Miss Darling, she's in danger. I, I must warn. Look, I'll have to I stay must... here. You go for Jan. Okay. When you get up there, call the police. You can't get outside on this phone. All right. All right. I'll hurry.
Mr. Smith. Stop it, please. Will you please call the police? What for? But look, I don't have time to... Mary! I'm sorry I had to do that. There's no time for hysteria. Now, what is this? The enzymes. The enzymes, they're, they're going crazy. Sure, Mr. Sensor. Now, you just relax and take it easy. Everything will be all right. We'll take care of those... You whatever do not you understand. Me. You do not understand that girl. You shouldn't have sent her upstairs. She's in danger. You must stop her before it is too late. Okay, as soon as the cops get here, we'll oh, take Oh, you fool, you fool. Miss Darling will kill her and tear her body to shreds. Miss Darling, kill Mary? Miss Darling is not a human being any longer. The enzymes have changed her. She will destroy the girl as a female wasp would destroy her enemies and then devour the remains. Then Bill found Mr. Zintrup's notebook in Cooper's desk. Oh, no, there's no mistake. We've got to call the police now. Now, Mary, you're just getting a little excited. Now, who could possibly want to hurt Mr. Cooper? I don't know. But it's not only Mr. Cooper. What about...
Okay, and I'll raise you seven. All right, all right, all right. What you call you, all right? What is that? Fish and chips. <laughs> you get it? Fish and chips. There's the yum up there. Fish and chips, see? That's fish and That's chips. Terrible. Delicious fish and chips. as old as the world itself. It extends over three quarters of the surface of the globe. The sea, the birthplace of life, the great storehouse of minerals, the prison of haunting mysteries. The ocean is a dangerous jungle. Each creature preys relentlessly upon another. Each animal is equipped with an effective weapon, speed, camouflage, knife-like teeth, poison. Since time began, the ocean has withheld its secrets. Man has ventured merely to its threshold. Oceanographers have, with precise instruments, presented us with a framework of facts. Around these facts, our imaginations reconstruct the eerie, forbidding atmosphere of the deep. Scientists, working with sonic equipment, discovered a mysterious layer which returned an answer to sound waves. This layer measured over 300 miles and lay 1,500 feet below the surface. It was soon noted that the phantom layer rose to the surface at night and descended to the deep water in the daytime. It is composed of living creatures capable of locomotion that are apparently strongly repelled by sunlight. Some oceanographers believe the layer to be made up of plankton. Others suggest that it is a gigantic concentration of fish. 
The most startling theory about the phantom layer is that it is composed of millions of squid. This theory is supported by the fact that squid are tremendously abundant. As the sun's rays become weak and soon turn into complete darkness, the fish are all black, brown, or silver. In the blackness of the deep sea, the strange phenomenon of luminescence is found. Half the fish that inhabit the darkened waters are able to turn their luminous torches on or off at will. Lower forms of life are known to have this luminous ability as well. Some fish have rows of lights. Perhaps these are signals, signs of recognition. The deep sea squid ejects a fluid which becomes luminous, a counterpart to the ink ejected by his cousin who lives in shallow water. The eyes of many creatures who live in the black world are enlarged and protruding, making the most of the intermittent lights which may reach them. On the other hand, some animals have no eyes at all. They have developed and perfected antennae and feelers. Their entire world is known to them through the sense of touch. Several years ago, a fish was caught alive off the southeast tip of Africa. It was an amazing sight. This animal was supposed to have been dead for at least 60 million years. After this discovery, they found the frill shark. He lived 25 to 30 million years ago. Perhaps there are other such anachronisms to be found in this region about which we know so little, other links with the past. Perhaps we can find the answers to many of these questions. We are now prepared to invade this black wilderness. I hope you enjoyed the pictures. We had a great time filming them. As most of you know, tomorrow marks the completion of Mr. Matheny's diving bell. I hope the next film we make will give us a lot more information. Do you really think you'll find it much different at greater depths? Occasionally, a new species may rise briefly to about a hundred feet from the surface and be seen by a diver. They return quickly, however, to oh, about 600 feet. We intend to see what may exist thousands of feet below that. Matheny, I've had a lot of admiration for the things you've been doing in shipbuilding and navigation equipment. Oh, but the diving bell of yours is sheer nonsense. It's a waste of money. I'm sorry you don't share our enthusiasm. Even if it does work, which is doubtful, does that justify the cost involved? Curiosity is one thing, but you spent over $70,000 on a toy. Have you ever heard of Millard Wyman? Of course, I've read his books, and I believe he's your brother. He believes the sea could hold a food supply vast enough to feed the entire world. You built this bell for him? Oh, I'm afraid Mr. Wyman needs no help from us. He had his practically completed at the time we began. Well, then what's the sense of enough? No frontier was ever explored by just one expedition. Our first dive will be in the Pacific. Then we'll try the Gulf. Right now, Wyman is in the Caribbean. He's making his first attempt with his bell somewhere along the southeastern Keys. I double check the bell. I'll be ready as soon as I get some clothes. Faith says our location is perfect. Looks like a big march finally here. Well, Laurie and I are all set. How about Miss Marshall? Oh, yes. No, never mind. I'll get him, Miss Try to relax, Mr. Wyman. You should be elated, not worried. I guess I'm too anxious. You look at me and think I was the one going down there. Well, let's get going. Wait, 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 anything until I come back up here with the pictures. What do you think I'm going down in that contraption for? Look, we'll have an absolute exclusive on this. Every wire service will get the depth information, but we'll be the only ones with the actual pictures. Now, doesn't that make much sort of sense? Come on, lady reporter. The time has come for your promotion. Or should I say demotion? Well, whatever it is, Skipper, you won't lose me on this show. I'll go on back to shore and call the office. Hold it. Thank you. Now, goodbye, Tom. Uh, good luck, Dale. Good luck, Dale. Thank you. Come on, Dale. 
Yeah, I know you're disappointed that uh, Tom couldn't make it, but he, I just couldn't get him to come out. He asked me to give you this. Well, I hope he knows what he's doing. Because I do. I shouldn't make a fool of myself telling you what this day means to me. Well, you people are taking my place in a way. I feel as if you've been working with me since the beginning. We're very grateful to be able to have a part in your work. You'll be going deeper than any man has ever attempted before. I wish I could go along with you. I know how you feel, Mr. Wyman. But I'll be talking to you every inch of the way. I know, Craig, but it's not quite the same thing. Well, good luck, Craig. Thank you. Paul, Mr. Wyman, you girls will let me down now. You take care of these fellows if they get scared. <laughs> hey, buddy, Robert. Craig, you ready? Ready whenever you are. Air pressure okay? Fine. Everything's 100%. Here we go. radioed from the ship. He'll interview Wyman before the launch gets out there. I can't believe it. The conditions were ideal. I see. Yes, of course I do. You can reach me here. I'll be in all day. Thanks for calling, Hank. Your brother's attempt was a complete failure. The bell broke loose at 1,700 feet. Can we contact the ship? I'm afraid we'll have to sit tight until Hank's men get into Key West. He promised to call us as soon as he hears from them. Mr. Wyman? Sorry to bother. 
barge in on you this way. We'll be leaving the ship soon. I wonder if you'd give me some information. You saw everything. What can I add to it? Or would you mind telling me something about the occupant? I know Dale Marshall, but not much about the other three. The other three, as you put it, were very brave people. Overconfident as I was. Well, had they been working with you long? Laurie and Paul were students of mine at the Institute of Oceanography. Craig joined us a bit later on, mainly, I suppose, because of Laurie's devotion. Well, did they have any part in uh, actually designing the bell? No, I'm afraid not. I am the only one who's responsible for that. Well, what do you believe went wrong today? I don't know. If I did, it wouldn't help matters. Well, the bell obviously had a weakness. You must have some idea where it was. Everything is planned and researched. I don't know the answer. The public will take a pretty dim view of your research. I suppose so. All right, opinion of me doesn't matter now. do you think we have? Oxygen tank only holds on the cubic feet. Well, at least the shutoff valves worked. We could have been flooded when the cable broke. Although I don't know what good it is to prolong the inevitable. Laurie worked with Wyman for three years to build this. Dale Marshall was going to get a big story. You were going to see new sea creatures for the first time. Three noble ambitions to be blown up by one engineering mistake. Oh, well, I probably wouldn't have seen any new... Craig. We're not on the bottom. There's light out here. You must be on some kind of a shelf not too far below the surface. I don't see how that's possible because we dropped out of the penetration of light. Well, how could we have moved upward? I don't know. At this point, I couldn't care less. Will we be able to get out of this thing? Look, at, at this level, the pressure shouldn't bother us. We should be miles in the darkness, but... Yet we're not. Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Let's check out of here. the surface. So just remember, try not to get panicky. Well, you better go first. Give the girl somebody to follow. Right. Oh, wow, man. Uh, wh wh what is that? It's a chicken sickle. <laughs> That's delicious. <laughs> Okay, all right. Swingoli again, reminding you of our motto here on Screaming Yellow Theater, our motto. <coughs> yes. Uh, blood is thicker than water. Right. But then again, so is toothpaste. See? <laughs> Can't argue with that. Okay, and now, folks, it's scare mail time. Bravo! 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 Hey, was 
that moving? Was that a great fit? Not it yet, Tommy. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Back to the scare mill. Oh, get a nice blackmail letter for a Monica Marco. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she comments on a movie we ran a couple of weeks ago called How to Make a Monster. She says the producer should have read a book called How to Make a Movie. <laughs> Monica lives in Beddington, which explains a lot. Hello to Little Pepper Dry and all his little pals in the Newtown chapter of the Valentine Jenicky oh. fan club. No, Borman, listen to this, folks. Big opening game tomorrow night. The Chicagoland Football League, a bunch of semi-pros. Yes, love you too, guys. It's the quarterback. At Notre Dame High in Niles, the Niles Saints versus the Borwin Barons. Ah! Huh? Get on, Barons. Yes. Rock em and suck em. Hello to Jeff Pickard in Galesburg, D. Huntley, D. Garnett in Huntley, Illinois, rather. John Novotny and his whole family. Love you too, John. And uh, Pat Barrowman on Avenue M in Chicago. Tony Sitar in Villa Park. Bernadette Phillips on South Costner. Oh, no Bernadette. We have no chickens for sale. Laura Mack in Palatine. Isabel yeah. Ajuria, North Sawyer. Congratulations to the newly engaged couple, Linda Lovell and Bill Schrode. Huh? Well, that's it. Don't forget to send your jokes, your songs, your poems, your obscene letters to yours truly, Svengoli, here at whatever this is. And now back to tonight's flick number one. Phyllis Diller, Jerry Stiller, and Howard Miller with Valentine Janicki as an aerial photograph of 26 miles of Abe Gibbons waistline in... The beef shortage hits the north side. Or meet me in St. Louis and Peterson, which is on the north side. It's the meat show. <laughs> They went, I suppose they figured it was worth a try. Isn't there something we can do? Some way that... No, they'll never make it to the surface even without the pressure. I'm afraid they were crushed the moment they left the bell. What we see is their bodies floating up over the currents.
radio BRI 421, calling ships in vicinity of longitude 23, latitude 75. Please stand by to search the area. Repeating, ships in vicinity of Marlin 8, please stand by to assist. How do you think it'll take for the bodies to reach the surface? It's been quite some time since we lost them on the sonar. They may not come up this far at all. Prepare to move out if we don't spot them in about five hours. I know it's none of my business, but didn't you have your own money tied up in that bell? I mean it was your own project with no affiliation. None of the universities had any confidence in it. Only myself and those down there. I understand there's another bell ready, built by an outfit in California. My younger brother designed it. They'll be interested in finding out where mine failed. I suppose we'll never know the answer to that. upon miles of these tunnels. Yeah. So many of them, we could easily get lost. We better head back. Yeah.
coming too soon. There's a storm following right in our way. Come in. Excuse me, sir, but I, I have something I believe is important. Yes? Well, I called to you and Mr. Wyman while I was watching the sonar, but... Well, apparently you didn't hear me, and I want to keep my eyes on the screen. You saw the bodies again? Well, sir, I, I don't know exactly what I saw, but I'm sure they weren't dead bodies. I saw two of the same masses move practically as they did before. How do you know they're the same? Well, the characteristics were identical. And they weren't floating. I'm positive they were moving under their own power. How long did you have them? Several minutes, sir. They moved along together, then one suddenly changed direction. I lost them at exactly the same spot as before. You probably saw some large fish that were curious about the bell. Begging your pardon, sir, but I've seen plenty of fish on that screen. I know this reading was of something else. You said they changed direction. The currents are pretty strong at that depth. But only one veered off. The other continued straight up. Well, whatever the objects were, it's a sense the bodies aren't going to float to the top, and we've wasted enough time as it is. Sir, it's possible that That'll they... be all, Wilson. Return to the radio room. I have problems enough with the storm to contend with. Yes. You know, if we had all the conveniences of a kitchen, I'd still prefer barbecue, just like this. When we leave here, what do we eat then? Well, these caverns have water pools everywhere. Probably fishing all of them. I also saw some planktonic shrimp back around the rocks. It must really be late. Anyone as tired as I am? You better get some sleep, Laurie. You too, Dale. We've been through a lot today. It'll probably do a lot of walking tomorrow. Dale and I found the crevice fairly dark inside. At least it will seem like night time. Don't worry about getting cold in there. I'll bet the temperature here doesn't vary two degrees. <laughs> you make it sound like Miami Beach. Come on. It's not the ocean floor either. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take all this diving gear along with us. Mm -hmm. It's too heavy. Leave it right here. What do you think our chances are? What do you really think? You sound as though I haven't been leveling with Dale and Laurie. I know you, Craig. You've got an uncanny ability to hide what you feel. Oh, I've been diving for quite a few years. But the deepest I ever went was about 200 feet. Frankly, I haven't any more idea about where we are now than you do. Well, haven't you ever heard of these underground caverns? I uh, read some theories about the Earth being honeycombed with caverns containing air pockets. Then the air we're breathing might not be coming from the surface? Possibly not, if you want to believe theories. How far down do you think we are? No idea. Might find out something about the mineral deposits along the way. Well, I guess only time will tell. I'm going to get some sleep. You know, I'll probably dream about breaking an altitude record in a helium balloon. <laughs>
we drink it? No salt content. Probably good as any well water. It's better. Sure we can, Laurie. We'll rest until you're ready. before you get anything else to read. But I need your advice, I'll ask for it. Sorry. I didn't realize. You don't realize a lot of things. You probably never will. I didn't mean to intrude, Dale. It was just a friendly joke. Friendly? <laughs> well, you just listen to me, Miss Innocent. There's nothing friendly between two females. There never was and there never will be. Oh, you feel that way. I was hoping we could help one another. You don't need any help. Neither do I. Not as long as we have two men around us. For that key? This is the hardest stone I've ever seen. But before I'm finished, we're going to have a first-class night. I think these rocks must be about 60% iron. Must be magnetized. The compass still acting up? No, it's not consistent. You know, I think it would be better just to follow our instinct. We could go around in circles. We've been doing some of that with the compass. You know, I've been following these rock formations. I still can't tell one from the other. Well, we're just going to have to notice everything that's slightly unusual. Make sure we don't pass anything twice. Hey, what do you say we break the tops off of some stalagmites whenever we can? It's a good idea. We've got to make a lot of markings because can't find enough stalagmites, we'll have to pile some rocks together. How do you account for that compass not working? Well, the iron in these rocks. Mm. I thought maybe it was because we were down so far. <laughs> eh, I guess not. Well, it could be that, too. But these are designed to work on a horizontal plane. We're getting pulled from every direction. You know, Craig, I thought of something we should have done when we went back to the bell. What's that? Well, those compression tanks are buoyant, right? Yeah. They can take a lot of pressure. We should have taken one, scratched a message on it, and then released it. Note in a bottle from a shipwrecked sailor, huh? Sure. Well, suppose somebody did find it. Do you think they'd send us an answer? At least they'd know we're alive. I think it's just as well they think we're not. Yeah, he couldn't possibly reach us. Yeah. Maybe you're right. But I'll bet some people really keel over when we do get out of here. Don't get too anxious. What do you mean? I mean, I think we're a long way off. But the fresh water. It's a good sign, and we certainly need it for survival. But I don't think it necessarily means that we're any closer to the top. Oh, look, Craig. I've been following the rock formations and the coloring. I've seen a definite change. Well, I have too. I'm simply judging by the number of hours we've traveled against the distance to sea level. Or maybe higher. Don't tell me you're getting cold feet, Craig. You know, I might be tempted to tell some of the boys from old Charlie Squadron about this. Well, I guess you wouldn't be lying to him at that. Well, don't worry. You can trust your old dad. I won't say a word. I've got faith in you, Craig. Why, when we get out of here, I'm going to be your best man. Come on, let's hit the road. <laughs> mm. Oh, hi there. I was just combing my bird. <laughs> combing my bird. And now, let's get, now let's get back to tonight's thrill-packed, screaming yellow Spengali blockbuster movie. The excitement. Would you... Would you wake up the projectionist, please? Arving, wake up there! 
Now, back to tonight's exciting feature. I thought I told you to keep Forky Jenkins out of here. What's the matter with you? yards back. We'll have to try going through it. And if that doesn't lead to another cavern? Then we'll have to drop back to the fork and try another course. That'll mean losing a lot of time. Well, let's try it. Yeah, let's go. until he dropped. But this is the best indication we've had yet. This man could have come down here directly from the surface. And I suppose he liked it so well he decided to stay here and die. Perhaps he just lost his way. Is that any better? dropping us to the bottom. We left the bell and found our way in here. You see, we were attempting to break a depth record. Oh, I'm Paul Whitmore. This is Craig Randall, Laurie Talbot, and Dale Marshall. I've been here 14 years. 14 years? Well, I don't think we want to stay quite that long. 
Would you mind leading us out? There is no way out. But how did you get here? And that fellow back there? He was killed a long time ago. I was more fortunate. But how did you get here? The same as you. And you haven't found a way out in all this time? There is no way. This is air we're breathing. It wouldn't be here if there weren't an opening to the surface. The air comes from a volcano about two miles from here. Are you sure of that? I'll show it to you. Would you like to visit my home? Well, I don't know. It isn't far. I'll take you there. idea if you'd wait down here with Dale and Laurie. Oh, now, wait a minute, daddy -o. I'm no babysitter. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll trade places with you. Okay, you win. We'll both go. I think the girls will be all right as long as we stay with him. Yeah. Besides, they're planning a swimming party, and we weren't invited. Come on. It's too bad we can't get a sun I can do without it. The sun always gives me a bad time. I got burned once at the beach and... Oh, well, it's not important now. We've been here quite a long time. They should be getting back soon. Are you afraid they'll bring bad news? I'm afraid I am. I keep telling myself that old man couldn't possibly be right. I can't make myself believe it. We'll know soon enough, one way or the other. You know, I was afraid until I realized that if we do spend the rest of our lives here, we can at least start a new one. Anything that happened in the past can't bother us here. Don't make me think about it. And let's not start painting any dark pictures before we know. They're here.
You're so quiet. Does that mean that... That volcano's there, all right. Starting air by the ton. And he was right. Well, that's... Laurie! Oh, no. Laurie, look, it won't be so bad. We took it hard, too, at first, walking down there and all that, but... Look, I know it's not going to be so terrible. After all, we've gotten... indicate the strike will be settled this week. On the local scene, Marine Research of California has abandoned the scheduled launching of an experimental diving bell. J.R. Matheny, president of Marine Research, is rumored to have lost some $90,000 constructing the bell during the past 18 months. And now for a look at the weather. Early morning fog will cover the harbor area with little change in temperature. consideration. Uh, the project has been costly and we've devoted the entire lab to the bell development. I'm afraid the wisest thing we can do at this time is just give up the project. This, of course, because of the results of mine. Why, but if it weren't for your pioneering and research, this bell wouldn't have even been built. When your brother came to work for me, I knew where his ideas were coming from. You mean your bell is similar to mine? As you can see, the designs are identical. Hatch, the cables. Are they the same? Well, yes. Why? Matheny, I'd like to ask you for a personal favor. A favor? You have no confidence in your bell because it was patterned after mine. And rightly so. But if I could take the responsibility off your shoulders... What do you think he does? I can make the dive myself. In the same location as before. I don't understand. 
How, how can you, of all people, consider doing this when you know that the bell is obvious? I believe it can be done. I've always believed it. If I can't at least turn my failure into a success, I'll be doing a grave injustice to four gallant people. What makes you think that the results would be any different this time? Since I returned from the Caribbean, I've been like a man who was living apart from his own soul. I knew there was an answer somewhere, but when I searched for it, my mind just wouldn't function. I think it was because of my condition that I finally discovered where the bell failed. You found the reason? The chain broke not at the weakest link, but at the strongest. I don't understand. The bell was designed with supports to take a stress five times greater than what we anticipated. We even thought of using booms on two different ships as an added safety factor. We overcame that with added couplings together with a, a pellet release system for balance. But in our extreme measures for added strength, we actually defeated our own purpose. Until we stopped work here, the plans were to use three ships for support. You don't need them. Depending on the overall weight descending, you must equalize the supports to parallel the point of water pressure above and below 2,000 feet. You mean it's, it's the pressure pushing upwards that causes stress? Exactly. We went all out for strength in supporting the bell. When it reached the point of water pressure where there was no up and down factor, the couplings ripped off the seams. Wyman, I know what a successful operation would mean to you. And I certainly want to help, but this is, well, this has all come so fast. I don't know what to say. Of course, I wouldn't ask you without offering something in exchange. I have a ship available that will take us to the Caribbean. It's fully equipped. The owner will do everything he can to assist. I suppose if I didn't go along with you, it'd only be a matter of time before you'd... You'd raise some money and be building another bell of your own. Just mean an unnecessary delay. However, I'm afraid there's one thing I'll have to object to. You're going under. But if I... If I know that young brother of yours, <laughs> you can jump at the chance. Let's go out to the lab and see him. Here it is, the Golden Gully, to another lucky recipient who will, as usual, have to accept it whether she wants it or not. Let me just move up here. She probably doesn't want it. Anyway, tonight, the highly coveted but shoddily made Golden Gully Award goes to Seymour Farblonget of East Cupcake, California. Ooh. Yes. It was Mr. Farblanchet who, aggravated for many years by the filthy ring around the inside of his bathtub each time he took a bath, which in summer was sometimes as often as every six to eight weeks, huh? Ooh. 
struggled valiantly in his laboratory, a laboratory seeking to invent something that would rid the world of this filthy menace. Well, finally, Seymour maybe hit upon something that, when used, would positively guarantee no bathtub ring. He invented the square bathtub, huh? Ooh, Isn't that ooh, marvelous? Ooh, 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 three times already this morning. I suppose that means I'm not doing my share of the work. That's not at all what I meant. Anyway, we'll have some decent containers as soon as the men come back from the bell. Well, I hope they bring my camera back with them. I could use it for one of the decorations. Well, Craig said that they would only bring back the most important things. I'm sure your camera... Craig said this. Craig said that. Craig said. What is he around here anyway? Some kind of monarch or something? Wouldn't take that old fool with him when he could use a couple of extra hands to help carry things. I'm sure Craig knows what he's doing. That's exactly what I mean. I'm fed up with his doing. Nobody's gonna dominate me. I'll see to that. Nobody's trying to. Do you think I'm gonna put up with this routine? You're crazy. Dale, there's nothing I can do to make you feel any better. Oh, yes, there is. And you're gonna start doing a few things my way. Dale, I don't want to argue with you. Will you just leave me alone? I'll leave you alone when I get good and ready to. And so will Craig when the time comes. So that's it. You're not getting all the attention. You're pretty smug, aren't you? Just because we're all trapped... That's enough! And Dale, I don't want to discuss this again. to get down there. You probably have enough air for one more dive. So let's make it count. Okay, well, I'll keep an eye on you. the other bell and they still can't believe it. How is Lori and Miss Marshall? Well, the girl's been doing all right. How long have you been out of air? Only a few minutes. I've got some coffee.
And now, you have to kill vaudeville and might do it to TV. So hold him in an airlock minute television and they're just about as funny. Say goodnight, Gracie, to Sven Gulli and Derwood. <laughs> Call it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we are, Spengulli and Dorwood once again. And Dorwood. Dorwood. Uh, well, what's the matter? Why are you shaking like that? Well, I wouldn't say it's cold here, but every time you open the door, the light goes on. <laughs> okay, all right, not Paul Noggin, enough of the really bum jokes. By the way, one of the guys in our Rex Venguli crew, director Don Camel, is Don, and Don Camel. You like that? Don Camel, I always get to laugh. Listen, Don Camel. He, anyway, Don's got himself a part-time job. A part-time job? I'm afraid to ask. What does he do? Well, he's working at Lincoln Park Zoo, feeding the fish for the pelicans. That doesn't sound like much of a job. No, but it fills the bill. <laughs> you get it? Okay, cool it. Dorwood, time for our really big finale number. And here we go to sing our song, Hit It, Boys. Ow, ow, ow! No, I mean, hit the song, not the, the director. I just flipped to get a sip of sweet hypo blood. Hit it. To get some, I'd grab a charm and give him a blood. Or a girl with neck of pearl who won't be a dud. I don't want to Floyd. You know it won't hurt. Not much. For an ounce on you, I'd pounce and bite on your neck. Eat it soon by next full moon or I'll be a wreck. Plasma, I can get. Plasma, vile than that. Sure, sure it's, it's rare, rare, but we don't, don't care. It's, it's sweet type of love. love. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Call it. Wait a minute, Dorman has something to say. Svengoli, speaking of blood, did you hear about the two hypochondriacs who wrote to each other? No, what about the two hypochondriacs who wrote to each other? <laughs> Wait for the punchline. They were penicillin pals. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go it. <laughs> better than the others. Well, that's just fine. I'm, I'm very glad you do. I will help you. Well, that's all I need. We will kill them. We will what? It is easy, like I killed Maurice a long time ago. And after we kill them, we can be alone here. Now, you stay away from me. Stay away! Stay away from me! Well, maybe I should kill you instead. <laughs> The volcano!
Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. How about you? We're all right. And the old man? He was killed in the avalanche. Here, put these on. Well, as we are. Uh, if Mr. Wyman's up there, tell him that Laurie is fine. She'll be saying hello in just a minute. Laurie, I... I think from now on my whole life will be changed. I realize how terrible I've acted. Do you think you can ever forgive me? Of course I can, Dale. I've always wanted our friendship. got the scoop of the year. Well, not this time, Jimmy. The story goes to all of you. I want you to meet your benefactor, Mr. Matheny. Mr. Matheny, we're very grateful. We have only Wyman to thank. Thank all you. his idea. Can't thank all of you enough. Come on, you people. Move back a little. Let's give them room to breathe. <laughs> room to breathe. You know, I never thought about it much, but there's nothing greater. Well, I don't know about you people, but man, I'm ready for a two-inch steak. Let's uh, come on! Joe Fingers car. <laughs> yes. No, just kidding. Actually, it's Bengali wrapping up the program here and not a moment too soon. Before we do, though, who would like to hear the Juan Peron song? The Juan Peron song? Okay, funny you should ask. Here we go. You always heard the Juan Peron. Oh. <laughs> You always heard there. Okay, and say, folks, don't you dare miss uh, this program next week at approximately the same time when our motion picture will be a real tearjerker. But no matter how much you cry and beg, we're still going to show it. Ha <laughs> ha! Good night and see you later. Da 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 da